how did we get from Blackmore to Dungeons and Dragons? And where did some of the mechanics that we now take for granted as a core part of D&D, like hit points and armor class, saving throws, alignment, even the idea of gaining experience points and going up in level, where did those ideas come from? Well, we're going to talk about all of that today on Daddy Roll the One. This is another video that is sponsored by me because I am going to be doing a Kickstarter for a new supplement that I've written for old school D&D type games. It's specifically written for old school essentials, but it will work with any kind of fantasy class and level system. It's all about playing experts and specialists, and it goes back to something that I began writing way back in 2005 for third edition, but I changed the mechanics and I changed sort of the purpose for the book to make it something that's equally appropriate for both players and referees or dungeon masters, if you prefer that term, to run games with experts and specialists. So it's got character class concepts and new classes, three new ones. It's got a guild hall with full maps with NPCs and motivations and secrets and rumors and all that kind of stuff. You can learn more by going to my Kickstarter pre-launch page to be notified when the campaign goes live. There's a link in the show notes below and thank you so much for your support. Hello there. And welcome back. I'm Martin. And today we're going to be talking about really where a lot of the concepts that we use in Dungeons and Dragons, where those ideas actually first started. And it's a much muddier situation than you might actually think. And a lot of it has to do with talking about Blackmore. So again, I've been talking about this game a lot, but these videos are all related, talking about my experiences at Dave Kahn playing Bronstein, then playing in the first campaign that was a Blackmore style war game. And then um, just talking with some of the people there that were involved back in the time, uh, at the, the people like Mike Carr and Dave McGarry and Bill Hoyt and Dave Wesley, and also I've been talking a lot with Kevin McCall, who was Dave Arneson's webmaster for a very long time and had a lot of conversations with Dave and has access to actually a lot of information and old documents that hopefully we'll be able to share those and see those in the future. So I've had a sneak peek at some things um, that I can't quite talk about or share yet, but there's a lot of information out there that I think will be helpful for people studying this type of thing in the future. So one of the things that's very confusing comes from this idea of like, okay, which, which things in Blackmore made it into D&D and which things in D&D were, you know, added after Blackmore. And you kind of end up in a situation where what people I think are actually trying to ask is what parts of Dungeons and Dragons did Dave Arneson create and what parts of Dungeons and Dragons did Gary Gygax create? And once again, it's not a clear cut definition all the time where you can look at something and figure it out very definitively. It ends up being this kind of like Lennon and McCartney situation, like which Beatles songs did John Lennon really write and which ones were more primarily under Paul McCartney. And to this day, a lot of times we don't actually know. People like to make guesses and they like to say that they know. But for the most part, there's a lot of times where there are specific things that people just don't know. And again, I think that's part of the problem with studying things like the history of these role playing games and specifically Blackmore. So part of the problem that we have when we're studying this is that you've got sort of three things happening that don't always agree. You have first person reports from people who were there, but those reports are coming decades sometimes after the actual fact. Okay. So you have, you have people from the Minnesota war games group who were there at the time and they're remembering things that happened at the time. And I think we ex are expecting a lot from them trying to pinpoint down, like at what point, like day, day, almost like date and time, did this thing happen? And I don't really think that's fair to try to expect people to have memories like that, that can, that can go back that far. Okay. So I think that they can be very directional and very helpful, but I found out just from my own purposes, talking to Dave Wesley, 
where there was just, and it was an honest mistake. Um, but I have in my notes, I wrote in my notebook when I was chatting with him about Bronstein and, um, he said 1969. Now I know he knows it's 1968 and he's later said it was 1968, but at the time when I was chatting with him and I think it was just either a slip of the tongue or maybe he just didn't remember whatever it was. Right. But that's a first person source giving me a date that was actually incorrect. And again, there's no, this is not me casting aspersions at Dave Wesley. My point is that that's not the only time that that's going to happen. Okay. So, but you do have these reports. Then you have very little documentation. Okay. And that's the other thing is like, because again, you have to remember when people were creating these games, when these games were being played, it was being done for the purposes of playing a game. It wasn't being done for the purposes of documenting things for posterity because there was no understanding. And there's no way there could have been any understanding that they were creating something that people were going to be playing and talking about 50 years in the future and wanting to know when specific things happen. And so a lot of times what you have are written reports from people after the fact. And those written reports don't always match what the first person accounts say when people are being interviewed. So the dates and times and situations and people involved, they're, they're nebulous and they don't always match up. And then add into that your armchair historians. So I guess I would throw my hat in there and say like, kind of, I guess that's what it was. It wasn't what I intended to do, but that that's part of what's been happening on my channel, which is totally awesome. But you have people like me who I have no academic training. I have no, I mean, you know, I went to college, but not for this. I, so I am not an historian. I am not an academic historian where um, I know there are specific rules that have to be followed when you're doing research to say, I did research on something doesn't mean you did some Googling and read a couple documents there. There's like, there's a specific use of research in academia and none of the people who are studying this and making videos about it or writing articles about it for the most part, they, they don't have that background. And I'm not saying it's, it's bad to not have that, but what happens is a lot of people, I think with good intentions, make these definitive statements about this thing happened at this time at on this date in this place. And um, I just don't, I don't have the, uh, it's just not something I'm going to do because there's just new information coming out all the time. So for me to try to tell you that this thing happened at this time, unless there's like, overwhelming evidence to say so. And I'm talking specifically about Blackmore here. And the reason that I'm bringing this up, it's it's important to understand what ideas from Blackmore came into Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. But timing wise, you know, I've had someone tell me like, it's, it's very, it's documented. It's beyond dispute. There's no contestation that Blackmore began in April of 1971 because there's court documents to prove it. Okay. There are court documents. Yes. That put that date. That was not meant to be the date when Blackmore started, that was meant to say it, it, that's the latest it could have started. And the reason that, that the court documents exist at all was because Dave Arneson was making a case that he was owed credit and therefore royalties for Dungeons and Dragons. And he had to prove his provenance in the creation of the system. Okay. So April of 1971 was the latest date that they could prove that like, okay, that's, that's the point. Like, at least we know it was playing by that point. Okay. And a lot of people have said, well, that's when Blackmore started as, as though, and I think this is what people want. People want this nice tidy, cause it's just how human brains work. People want this nice and tidy way of saying Dave Arneson created Blackmore almost like in a vacuum. He created the game and then he debuted it in front of all of his players in April, 1971. And that was Blackmore. Well, it didn't work that way. We already know I played a game, a pre Blackmore game, but it's in the style that um, Dave Arneson played with Bill Hoyt and Gary Gygax. And that game took place in 1969. So Dave Arneson was running medieval style Blackmore games or medieval style Bronstein games in Blackmore prior to 1971. So I showed that article from corner of the tabletop where he announces that he's going to be running a medieval Bronstein game. And the date of that, it says 1970. A lot of people have come after and said that was a type that was actually 1971. It very well may have been 1971, but 
just because that's the first time that you see him put it in print doesn't mean that that was the first Blackmore game. Okay, we know from, and again, from my conversations with Dave Wesley, part of Dave Arneson's problem that he was having with the folks in the Minnesota gaming group was that he was younger than everybody else. And so you can go to my video on Blackmore and read in the comments, Dave Wesley came into the comments to help provide context for the Dave Arneson situation. But basically what he says was Dave was about three years younger than Dave Wesley. Dave Arneson was three years younger than Dave Wesley. It gets confusing because there's so many Daves. So, and Dave Wesley was at the age as were most of the players at that time um, of legal drinking age. And so Dave Wesley says at the time, that was a big dividing line to basically show how grown up you were, was that you were able to imbibe alcohol like legally. And Dave Arneson wasn't able to do that. And so that became sort of this division was like, well, he's too young to be playing with us because we're going to go out and drink or we're going to bring drinks to the games, like whatever. And, and that created a division, a situation where that was used as as sort of like the measuring stick of like, okay, Dave Arneson's too young. And so we're not going to listen to him and we're not going to let, let him participate the way that he wants to, or that we're not going to respect him because he's not old enough. Okay. And that had a huge impact on Dave Arneson to the point where he wasn't necessarily going out of his way to put himself out there and announce that he was running these games. OK, by the time you get to 1971, however, a lot of these older players have left. So Dave Arneson is now of, at that point, legal drinking age. So they could have been gaming together. But as Dave Wesley d describes it, like the kind of the roles had already been cast and these older players decided to kind of form their own group, their subgroup that did not include Dave Arneson. And they were playing the games without him the way they wanted to play. And Dave Arneson was not part of that group. And so Dave Arneson finds new players, younger players who are younger than him in some cases, who don't have that context and didn't see the situation where Dave Arneson was sort of being excluded from the group. All they know is that he's running the group. And so now he's getting the confidence to announce that he's doing this because these older players are no longer there to like hassle him. OK, it's almost like a form of bullying. That's a very strong term to use. Um. And that's my term. No one told me that. And just as I read through it, that's what it sounds like to me, that he was being bullied by these older players. And so they went off to do their own thing and excluded him. And rather than, you know, succumb to that, Dave Arneson found his own way of dealing with it, which is just to recruit new players that didn't have that context. And and so, so to see that note in Court of the Tabletop and to make an assumption that that was the first time that he ran Blackmore is incorrect. OK, at least from what I have seen. And there, there's plenty of documentation from interviews with the players in the group, some of the players who definitely have a memory of playing Blackmore before 1971. And it's 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 a lot. OK, so we have that. Those again, those first person, um, you know, accounts from people who were there. And again, they sometimes contradict with other things that are written documentation. And so I think you have to take all of it into consideration. You can't pick one and not the other. OK, here's a quote from Dave, Arnahim, Dave Arneson himself. This is in his first fantasy campaign. We've talked about this before, but just in case you're new to the channel, you haven't seen this. First fantasy campaign is Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. This is the stuff that Dave Arneson wrote that he thought was going to be part of this book. Blackmore Supplement 2. And the majority of it got edited out. Okay, we'll talk about that later, maybe, you know, shortly. But this is Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. But at this point, he's left TSR and TSR is not going to publish this. So this is published by Judges Guild, um, who very smartly put this red type on a very dark background, which is almost impossible to read. But in any event, um, this is Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. And the Blackmore Dungeons. The dungeon was first established in the winter and spring of 1970, 1971. Okay, so he's talking about the dungeon part of Blackmore. Blackmore exists pre-dungeon or pre-castle. Okay, but he's even saying 1970, this would be like, you know, around the holidays of 1970 and going into 1971 before the April date in that corner of the tabletop where he says he's going to be running that game in April of 1971. Okay. 
However, you have in print him saying April 1971, I'm going to be running this game. That's the date that gets used in the court documents to prove when Blackmore starts, because there is no written documentation before that time that could settle the matter. OK, so you pick the date and time, but that doesn't mean that's when Blackmore started. I know I'm harping on this a lot. I just want to make sure people understand Blackmore as a game and as a as a style of gaming predates that April 1971 date. Now, another reason why it's so difficult to pinpoint exactly when Blackmore you know, started, for lack of a better term, is because Blackmore is evolving and changing over time, and there's different types of Blackmore games. So it's kind of similar to Bronstein. Okay, so if you watch my video on Bronstein, you know that I played in a recreation of the first Bronstein game. Okay, the the one that takes place in in the fictional town of Bronstein in uh, Prussia in 1797, I think was the date. Okay, however, there are multiple Bronstein games. Okay, so Bronstein four is uh, again in a banana republic in South America in the you know 1960s. Okay, that's the setting. So it doesn't even take place in Bronstein, but it's called Bronstein four because it's using the concepts of role play from Bronstein 1. Now, Bronstein 2 and 3, the mechanics, how the game worked was very different from Bronstein 1. Okay, so I'm not going to get into how, but it, they, they, it was different. So to say, like, well, when did Bronstein start? We know when the first Bronstein game was held. In that particular case, we do know. So that one's a little bit different. But there are different versions of Bronstein because it is evolving and changing over time. Dave Wesley's figuring it out. He's figuring out what works and what doesn't work and what his players like. And what they don't like. Well, that's something that Dave Arneson is doing as well. So when he starts running his medieval Bronstein games, he is listening to his players and incorporating their ideas. And that is a that is a key hallmark of Dave Arneson's sort of approach to this type of game is being inspired by and listening to his players and then creating things that will you know, make them happy because, you know, of things that they wanted to incorporate in the games. So that's why you will often hear people say like, oh, you know, the first Bronstein game was this. Well, it's like, or the first Blackmore game for it, it was, was, you know, when the descent into the dungeons under the castle. Well, that was that player's first Bronstein game. Not, I keep saying Bronstein. That was that player's first Blackmore game. It wasn't the first Blackmore game. And I don't think at this point we're ever going to know the exact date of when, quote, the first Blackmore game ran because Blackmore was changing. And as you saw again in my video, mine was much more war game focused. OK, so it still had role play elements, but it was definitely more role or uh, more war game focused than even the Bronstein game that I played. But then later on, Dave Arneson is running Blackmore games that are more like that first Bronstein game that remove the troops remove the armies, but retain the, uh, again, the role play elements of the commanders and things like that. And so to, uh, the, but those are both Blackmore type games, as I talked about before. So it's evolving, it's changing, and everyone's having different experiences depending on what they wanted out of it and what they were expecting to play. So when you look at something like First Fantasy Campaign from Dave Arneson, OK, so here's in here you have the campaign. OK, this is right at the beginning. Now, look at these tables. He's talking about the Great Invasion Scenario 3, and he's got the evil forces of the Egg of Coot, the Duchy of Ten, the Nomads of Ten, the Men of Mouse, and Monks Vikings. And he's got how many army points they have and their income. And then he's got the neutral forces, and then he's got the good forces. OK, and, he, and they all have point values. OK, so that's wargaming. That that that's that's kind of more that aspect of it. He's talking about these armies and what kind of weapons that they're going to use. Heavy cannons and bombards and standard bows and long bows and all this kind of stuff. So this is less of the role play type stuff in this upfront section here. OK, so Blackmore ultimately becomes a role play game, I want to say exclusively role play game, I think, you know, it still does have some of those other elements to it. But 
um, over time, it evolved again, I was talking about it's evolving and it becomes more of what we, you know, now would call a role play game. Right. But at the beginning, it's involving these other things um, that Dave was experimenting with. So because of that evolution, I think, you know, it's going to be very difficult to say because people have in their head what they think Blackmore means. What is it? And I think that there's this idea that, you know, it's a set in stone thing of like, this is Dave Arneson's version of Blackmore. And I think he had multiple versions that he was working on over time is what I'm saying. So because of that, I think that it's, it's going to be difficult. And, you know, I talked about those court documents earlier and, and why that date, um, you know, I don't look at it as being the first Blackmore game um, because court, don't always understand this kind of stuff. And I'm not saying don't trust the courts. I'm not some kind of weird conspiracy theorist about anything like that. But there's a court document later on when this book is published. This is 1983, The Monster Manual 2. Okay, so if you know anything about Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, you know that this is a book of new monsters for the game of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons that haven't been published before. Some of them maybe had been in like, um, you know, modules and things like that. Um, for the most part, this is all new stuff. 1983. So see my video on the history of Advanced Gender Dragon Hardbacks, if you don't know what I'm talking about. But this book is published, and Dave Arneson is not getting royalties from it, okay? Even though he had a deal with TSR that he shouldn't. So he has to go to court again and um, get to, to convince them that he should get the royalties from this. And in the court documents that say that, yes, he should get royalties. The court document describes the Monster Manual 2 as a revision of Monster Manual 1. Now, again, if you know anything about Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, you understand this is not a revision of this. There is no monster in here that has revised and changed in this book. This is entirely new books. It's just Monster Manual 2 because it's more monsters. It's not revised monsters, it's more. So, if you didn't know anything about this and someday looked at those court documents, you might think that this is a revision of this and it is absolutely not. So I don't think using court documents as the end all be all of these things is necessarily the right choice. OK, we have to dig deeper and keep looking for information to try to figure this stuff out. All right. But all that said, again, I'm not an academic, so I'm not necessarily going to be the one that's going to be able to do that. So all I can do is talk about the information that I found, the interviews that I did with the folks that were there and, you know, talk about, um, about that and approach it from that standpoint. But at this point, I'm not going to, you know, draw a line in the sand and say, this is when it started. I'm just going to say, we're learning about things all the time. The game was evolving and Dave Arneson was being inspired by his players to make changes and evolve it. And I think that that's the best that we can do right now. Now, what does all that have to do with how we get from this to this? Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this video. So the concepts, I think that's, that is something that we can talk about. What are the concepts, the mechanics that make their way from this to this? Now, one of the things that's really interesting is that there's going to be things that we know now. Um, but that might change later as new information comes to light. So I mentioned this before, but there are some pre-publication Dungeons and Dragons documents. John Peterson's talked about them before. And um, one of them very specifically, I think, will help to make a lot of this kind of speculation and, and put it into context about what was Dave working on that got adopted into this game? And I will say it's a lot more than what's been proposed that, you know, he only supplied a few pages of notes and that, you know, Gary had to like create it from scratch, basically. Um, that's a, a lot of misinformation. I'll put it that way. Um, hopefully one day we will be able to have specific proof of these pre existing DD publications. Or they're not publications, they're drafts, I guess. They weren't published. Um, but there are documents that will, again, hopefully start to help us answer some of these questions. But there are folks that need to sort of verify and corroborate the, their existence and, and show the provenance of where they came from. And until that happens, you know, we can't really talk about it. But we can talk about some of the elements that we do know.
And that's going to be for me talking about, again, hit points, armor class, saving throws. There's alignment. There's level titles. I'm trying to think of everything I want to talk about in this video. Character classes, experience points, and leveling. And then lastly, I want to talk about the fantasy elements that get put into here and sort of like, or, you know, really put into here. Where did those fantasy elements come from? What was happening at the time? And they might be a little bit different than what we now think. Okay, so let's just kind of get started and talk about that. And again, my point is I don't have a dog in this fight. So I think there's a lot of people, again, that want to have this sort of like Arneson versus Gygax thing 50 years later. There's still people arguing about this and they get very passionate about it. And I just don't really think that gets us anywhere. Um, again, I think you have three people that are really fundamental to this game being published that we're still playing 50 years later. You've got Dave Wesley sort of, he doesn't, you know, he, he, he creates the role play aspect in his Bronstein games. He, he figures out how to do that. And so he has role play in Bronstein. Dave Arneson credits Dave Wesley very specifically says that D and D starts from role play and role play starts with Dave Wesley. Okay. But Dave Arneson has role play in Blackmore. So he is role playing in Blackmore. Dungeons and Dragons comes about. Gary Gygax does have a passion for wanting to get this thing out in the public. He wants people to know about it and he wants to be able to take what Dave Arneson is doing and make sure that everyone can do that. And so you have to figure out a way of writing that down in a it's something that's that's a challenge, figuring out how to describe what these guys were doing and putting it into a form for somebody who has never seen it played and has never participated and trying to explain to them and teach them, here's how to run a game. And that's why people complain about Dungeon Master's Guides all the time. Like I see so many complaints about the fifth edition Dungeon Master's Guide that it doesn't teach you how to play Dungeons and Dragons. And that is a core problem that's plagued the game for decades, that it is very difficult to teach this game to people who haven't seen it being played before. And I think one of the reasons why it's so popular now is because there are all these channels, you can't underestimate the, the power of critical role to expose people to this game that didn't know what it was, but then finally see it in person. I'm not a critical role watcher. I've ever, actually never watched it before, but I know a lot of people did. And, and because seeing it played and being able to do that in a wide format that can reach millions of people on YouTube is so much easier than trying to read it in a book. OK, but Gary Gygax does his best writing this based on the information that he got from Dave Arneson. Now, one of the things that I was told, so I'm just going to say this is kind of hearsay, but one of the things I was told is that. Gary is rushing. He wants to publish this game and he is he is writing very, very quickly. Once Brian Bloom and um, his father come on board to contribute money to the company, they want their investment back. OK, so they are pushing Gary to get this game out as quickly as he can. Now, we know that Dave Arneson is not the best typist. I th think he admitted that. And you know, all the things that you saw from my game that I played in that, like that first campaign, that Blackmore style game that Bill Hoyt ran at, at Dave Con for us. Um, you see all those um, handwritten notes from Dave Arneson, and you can see he's not great at spelling. So he spells peasants as pheasants. Um, he also at one point um, in another document refers to Bavaria as Bravaria. So he's not confident in his typing and spelling skills. He's being pressured to get this information to Gary Gygax and from handwritten notes, and he's not great at typing. So he's trying to get it as much as he can. So, you know, the the um, rumor that you hear and it gets repeated often is that basically Dave provided like a few pages of notes to Gary and that Gary had to expand it into into this game. Well, Dave and again, this is what I was told. Dave wasn't providing those few pages of notes with the intent of being that that was all he was going to give. He was doing it piecemeal to try to just appease Gary and get that stuff out there. And he was working as fast as he can, but it was at a slower pace because again, he's not a great speller. He's not a great typist. He had people trying to help him. He's trying to organize his notes because he was running these games and he knew what he was doing, but he wasn't, he hadn't written it down in a format that it was going to be easy for someone else to do. And so 
asking him to do that on this quick timeline, that's where you get this, this rumor that's oft repeated that he just provided a few pages of notes when in fact there was more to the game than just that. So let's talk about some of these ideas that are concepts or mechanics that are in Dungeons and Dragons and try to figure out where they came from. How did they get into the game? So a lot of these concepts are going to kind of overlap, but I want to talk at the beginning here about hit points, armor class, and saving throws. So those are kind of the three areas I'm going to be talking about at the beginning part here. And one of the things that I learned at the convention that was told to us was that the reason that armor class in Dungeons and Dragons in this game, the reason the armor class is descending so that you know better armor has a lower um, point to it than higher armor. So in this case, it goes from nine to two. So nine is unarmored and two was plate, mail and shield. OK, so the reason they said that it, it went that way, it was because of naval war games. And it was because in those naval war games, um, a first class ship was the top of the line and it had better armor than a, let's say, fifth class ship. So that players were used to this, war gamers were used to this. And so this idea that lower armor class was better came from these games. Well, I, I, it's funny, Professor Dungeon Master just made a video about this and he repeated the story that we heard at the convention. And it's a great story and it makes sense. And I tried to do a little bit more digging to kind of find out. And where that started was that, I guess, Dave Arneson says that. Dave Arneson says that um, it came from this, you know, naval war game. However, he was never able to articulate what war game it was. And it turns out it looks like it was from a game that he was working on that was never published, an ironclad American Civil War game. Okay. And because it was never published, I've not seen it. So I don't know that that game does have, you know, better class ships having a lower value, lower class than um, a higher class ship having, you know, not being as strong. Okay. Because if you look at Don't Give Up the Ship, which Dave Arneson worked on with, you know, Gary Gygax and um, uh, Mike Carr, I believe, that is originally published by Guidon, who was the original publishers of Chainmail before TSR published it. Um, and Don't Give Up the Ship, a class one ship is a um, maximum 300 tons. And a class five ship, I think it's five, it might be six, is 1,500 tons. It's bigger and it's stronger. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a ship that can take more damage. So don't give up. The ship would say that it, it is, it goes in order. Okay. So it, it, just as you would think it's an ascending order, a lower class ship has a lower number. So I find it interesting that Dave would have created this naval game where, um, a higher class of ship meant it had more value. So, but not a higher class, a, a lower class ship like class one is the best. And it's, it's very possible. Again, I just can't see it. And I can't find any other naval war games from the time period where that was the case. Now I will freely admit I'm not much of a war gamer. I haven't played really a lot of naval war games. So my exposure is very limited, but in trying to like talk to people and, you know, follow up questions about like, what was this idea? All that was repeated back was just the same statement that it comes from naval war games where a first class ship was the top of the line, the best of the line. And that's where why armor class is that way. However, in Chainmail, and remember that Chainmail is a later publication from rules that were published in Domesday number five, which interestingly, if you look at that, those rules were credited to Jeff Perrin, you know, with Gary Gygax. However, now we see Gary Gygax has put his name first here. Um, but in Chainmail, interestingly enough, the same values that are used for armor class in Dungeons and Dragons are used here, but reversed. So in this particular case, I think this goes from one to eight instead of two to nine. But uh, if I remember correctly, I just don't want to flip through. But the idea was that a higher value made it more difficult to be hit. So a higher value was the best and eight was plate, mail and shield and one was unarmored. However, combat in here uses two six sided dice. So you're rolling two D six 
to try to determine if you've hit or not. Of course, combat in here, if you use the alternative combat rules, as opposed to these rules, combat is based on a D20. And so you have to like come up with some different formulas. Now, interesting later, interestingly, later on, Gary Gygax is quoted in an article and he says like, oh, I made a mistake and I really stepped into it when I reversed the armor values. But it, he doesn't really say why he reversed it. He just says, I reversed the armor values from chainmail. And that's why you have descending in this particular game. He doesn't offer rationale or game mechanic reasons for reversing it. He just says that he did, but had he kept it the other way, then you would have just rolled a D20 to try to beat the target number, okay? So uh, again, you've got two conflicting reports because at the same time you have Dave Arneson saying, no, I used descending armor values in Blackmore because it was in this naval war game. So once again, I don't think the answer is as definitive as people necessarily want. Okay, so sorry to, to say that, but armor class is gonna be related to hit points and saving throws. And a lot of that is coming out of this idea that when Dave Arneson was creating Blackmore, and again, uh, as a reminder, it's evolving, it's changing over time. Well, one of the things that happens in one of the games of Blackmore that he runs is that one of his players, Bob Meyer, and there were a few others as well, but they um, ended up dying, like after being hit one time. And the reason for that is because Dave Arneson had started implementing some mechanics from Domesday number five, which are again are the precursor to the chainmail rules that are going to be published in 1971. But he's using them um, before that, so without the fantasy supplement. And he is later on quoted, Dave Arneson's quoted as saying that, like, you know, he used the chainmail rules for a couple of times and that it didn't work out. And what he's talking about is he's using those rules from Domesday, not the published rules from this, but they're similar. So it's, it's, it's really just more about like when they were published and when Dave Arneson had access to them. So he says that it didn't work because this is based on war games like armies, not individual man-to-man -man combat. Okay, or it wasn't designed for that. Or if, and if it was, it was like a retcon. Okay, so he has to figure this out. So one of the things that happens is Bob Meyer is so upset that his character died after being hit one time. He quits the game, doesn't come back for like a very long time. And my understanding is a few other players, a very similar thing happened. So Dave Arneson is trying to figure out a way to make it so that characters can be hit more than one time because Chainmail is very much like it's not you don't do damage. You just roll dice. And if you hit that thing's dead, okay? Or killed or you know, put out of action, okay? So Dave Arneson's trying to figure out a way around that. So he starts incorporating these other ideas. So remember, Dave is is likes to be inspired by challenges that come up and then figuring out solutions. But a lot of what he does is look to things that came before and figure out how to adapt them. Just like Dave Wesley looked at things that came before to get him to create Bronstein, where he's looking at Strategos and then he creates Strategos N and then he incorporates the referee and this, you know, the the um, the zero sum scenario where like, you know, everybody can win. There's no winner. There's like everyone's playing and like everyone's can can be the winner. So just like he is being inspired by things that came before, Dave is being inspired by things that came before. And in this naval game that he was working on, this ironclads game that I think also takes inspiration from other games. Um, warships have two elements to them. They have in, in these naval type games, they have um, how easy is it to penetrate their armor or an armor class it wasn't called armor class, but that's essentially what it is. The ability to penetrate the armor to do damage to this warship. And if you do, how much damage can that ship withstand in order to, um, you know, before it's sunk, essentially. Okay, so that's like essentially an early form of hit points. And Dave is taking that concept and he's adapting it, changing it, modifying it for his needs to put into this game. And so then what you get is this idea that because in the in the naval games, certain types of weapons can penetrate armor better and do more damage. And so Dave is incorporating this idea of hit points and levels so that a higher level character can do, or it has a better chance of hitting, okay, all that kind of stuff. It's all rolled in together. And 
And then you have this idea of like saving throws, giving you a chance to not die when something bad happens. Well, really, if you look at it at an, at an abstract level, which is what all of this is supposed to be, and none of it was intended to, to um, replicate or imitate a real life scenario. It's abstract, as I've talked about before. Hit points, armor class, and saving throws, all three of those concepts when you understand that they were put into the game to help sort of assuage this fear that if my character gets hit one time, I'm going to be dead and be out of the game. Those are all kind of a, a, a form of luck almost, or they're all kind of saving throws. If you, if you when you boil it down to what they're doing, because that's what, that's what they're doing. They're giving your chance, your character a chance to survive. You're giving them a chance to maybe not be hit or for whatever armor you're wearing to absorb that hit. And really how you narrate that is up to you because the effect is the same. So, you know, I think a lot of people get caught up in this idea of like, why does armor make it so that I'm, um, you know, uh, harder to hit? Like if I'm wearing heavy armor, I should be easier to hit because I'm slow. Well, that's because that armor class isn't meant to replicate that you're being harder to hit. So the implication is that if you're wearing heavier armor, it's probably being hit multiple times. It's just the weapon is not going through. It's not um, penetrating that armor. Whereas a lightly armored thief with a high dex who also has a high armor class, you can narrate as dodging out of the way. But that's really kind of irrelevant because the point is the same. The armor class is doing its function, which is to help preserve your character and give your, chance, your character a chance to survive. Then if you get past the armor class, your character has hit points. And so your character has another chance to survive. So all of these things are being added to the game in a way to make it so that your character has more of a chance to survive versus just being hit one time. Okay, so saving throws very similar. Saving throws date back pre Dungeons and Dragons, pre Blackmore to war games. But Dave Arneson is taking those, and I don't think you can point to a specific game and say he got it from this game. It's a concept that's been around, but Dave is adapting it and modifying it and putting it into the game. So Dave has hit points, armor class, and saving throws in Blackmore before Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, so that's kind of the key takeaway from here. As far as like specific trying to say like he got it from this, he got it from this, that's not something that we're able to do at this point in time because again, there were so many things that came before this that he's he's taking elements from to make it his own. Okay, and that was something that Dave Arneson was very, very good at. Okay, um, he was also very, very bad at self-promotion, unlike Gary Gygax. And again, it's not a quibble. It's, I'm, I'm not denigrating Gary, but Gary was very good at promoting himself and his role in role-playing games and, and the hobby. And Dave Arneson, um, it was described to me as, you know, he is Minnesota nice. That is a thing. I just, I encountered it when I was in Minnesota for DaveCon. Um, Dave Arneson was always first to like, you know, credit other people rather than credit himself. And so when he was trying to, you know, when he, when he ended up having to sue TSR and then later on there's settlements that include money. What I've been told is that he gave a lot of that money away, gave it to his church or, you know, to other organizations. And because it wasn't about the money, it was more about the principle of like, you know, he helped this game. It wasn't the creation of a single person, which, you know, for the longest time in the hobby was that was kind of the narrative that was proposed. OK, so you've got those three things. Now, let's talk about next up. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of leveling and experience points. So where does this idea come from? It is a novel concept in this style of game, this this idea of gaining experience, gaining levels, and getting better over time, and then being able to play that same character over time, that same role, okay? So that idea, well, it originally comes, not the experience points necessarily, points is very specific, but experience in general comes from kind of this game. It's actually the precursor to this game. So this is Dawn Patrol which is a version of an, a game that was originally published in 1966 by Mike Carr. Again, a part of this Minneapolis gaming community. Um, but he created a game in 1966 called Fight in the Skies, World War I Aerial Combat. 
uh, TSR eventually gets a hold of the game. They 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 buy the rights and and they publish um, other versions of it, like other editions. You should say you could say. So this is, I think, technically the seventh edition of the game. But by this point, they've changed the name from Fight in the Skies to Dawn Patrol. And then as you see here, very specifically, they say it's a role playing game of World War One air combat. So. This is a new acquisition for me. So I actually picked this up at DaveCon. There was a gentleman there who um, was looking to uh, maybe offload some of his older um, gaming materials. And he had this game and um, sold it to me at a very, very fair price. Uh, the box is not in great shape, as you can see here. And it, it's a kind of coming apart on the uh, insides. But in any event, um, because I got this there, I was able to get this signature by Mike Carr. He signed it for me and I chatted with him quite a bit. And uh, those conversations I'm gonna keep mentioning over the course of this video and in the future. But um, Fight in the Skies and Dawn Patrol is really the earliest example of this idea of gaining experience and then having that pay off in the future in terms of like, you're better at doing things, okay? so. Uh, very specifically, the experience was based on missions. So how many missions had you accomplished? And then if you successfully survive a mission, then the next time you're going to be a little bit better at what you need to do because you have that experience. You've, you've, you've gained knowledge and experience from having done something so that you're going to be better at trying to do it the next time. So I have yet to play Dawn Patrol. I watched a little bit of it being played, but um, my car ran a game of this and it conflicted with me playing in the Blackmore game. So um, I wasn't able to, or it might've been Bronstein, but at any event, I wasn't able to, to participate in this. But, um, you know, I, I have started reading the rules. And so, but it's, it's pretty at this point, it's pretty much known that Mike Carr kind of invented this concept of experience and level. Now, what Dave Arneson did was figure out, like, you know, take that, take that system, that idea of gaining over time, and then apply it to a point system. So Dave Arneson is the one who created experience points with the idea of like needing so many points in order to then advance up in, in experience and um, get better at what you were doing. Okay. So based on an idea from my car, absolutely. But the idea of using experience points is something that comes from Dave Arneson. So that was a part of the Blackmore game. So, so far we have hit points, armor class, saving throws, and now experience points and leveling coming from Blackmore, all of that predating Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. So um, what else do we have here? Well, one of the things that I wanted to chat about briefly was character classes. Now, Blackmore doesn't necessarily have classes in the way that we think of them. So I call them roles. Other people said that you could call them archetypes. I think both work. But if you remember in the Bronstein game that I played in, I was handed a, a sheet of paper that told me that I was going to be student G and it gave me what my um, objectives were. These are the things that I have to try to accomplish by the end of the game in order to promote myself as being someone who should who should, you know, be called one of the winners. So. Blackmore was played very similarly where Dave Arneson would a lot of times assign people characters. Now, this wasn't always the case. So as an example, um, Peter Gaylord, I think his first name's Peter. I should have written this down. I, did, I just remember his last name's Gaylord. Um, he and his wife both played in the game. So his wife is Gail. And uh, she did end up helping Dave Arneson with a lot of the typing, I believe, um, for uh, because again, he wasn't a great typist, right? But Peter Gaylord, in any event, he approached Dave Arneson and said, I want to be a wizard. And in one of the games that they played, like Dave Arneson had to figure out, okay, what does that mean? Like, what, what are you capable of doing? And one of the games... Peter um, Gaylord wanted to throw a quote unquote fireball because that's what wizards do. So he's basing that on the scene from the Hobbit where Gandalf grabs pine cones off the tree, sets them on fire and throws them at the wargs that are at the bottom of the tree when all the, the hobbits have been treed or I'm sorry, the dwarves have been treed by the wargs um, on their way to, you know, um, try to, uh, you know, encounter with smog and, and get their gold back. So 
that's what Peter Gaylord has in his mind. And so Dave Arneson then had to figure out mechanically, how is he going to make that happen? How is he going to be able to adapt that? And so he starts to figure out the mechanics of making that happen. So Peter Gaylord's playing the archetype or the, you know, idea of a wizard, but again, not a class necessarily. Now, the other thing though, that Dave Arneson did do was go to, as an example, Mike Carr and say, you're going to be a cleric. So Mike Carr didn't pick to play that. He was assigned it by Dave Arneson. Well, why was he assigned this? We talked a little bit about this before. Um, if you see my video on the cleric and the ranger and bard, but a link to that up here, but Mike Carr was assigned this. So What's interesting was one, he uses the term cleric, which I thought was very interesting. And I've asked like, how come he didn't use another more well-known term like a priest or something like that? Um, I didn't get a very definitive answer on that, just that that was the term that he used. Also very interestingly, he told Mike Carr that he could only use blunt weapons. So the idea in first, you know, in, in an original D&D that goes all the way through first edition that Clerics could only use blunt weapons. That starts with Dave Arneson telling Mike Carr, you're going to be a cleric and you can only use blunt weapons. Now, I've once again asked, why did Dave say that? Where is this coming from? And it does go back to this idea that's been promoted before that there were medieval stories. And I, I think it was um, Bishop Turpin. I forget exactly who it was. Um, I'm, I might be getting my metaphors mixed up, but again, I, I do mention it in that video on the cleric. There was a story of, you know, the idea of like, you know, not wanting to shed blood and that gets translated to not using edged weapons. So you can only use blunt weapons. Now, mechanically, there's other reasons though to do it. And I've talked about that before. It's actually in my video on the thief class. It's a weird way to put it, but it deals with magic item distribution and that because clerics have the ability to fight and use spells, one of the balancing factors is that they would not have as much access to magical weapons and um, maces then like there are fewer magical maces on the magic item distribution tables when you're rolling randomly for treasure the dm's not just deciding what's there the dm is rolling for treasure on tables and one of the um balancing factors is that a magical mace is going to come up much fewer or much less times than a magical sword or a magical dagger and a fighter can use a magical sword. And one of the balancing factors that fighters go up in levels is that they have greater chances to access magical swords on these tables because distribution wise, there's a higher percentage to roll a sword than a mace. So that's a mechanical retcon reason. But originally Mike Carr was told that he was going to be a cleric and he couldn't use blunt weapons. The other thing that I did ask Mike Carr was because someone brought this up and they said, no, the cleric predates D&D &D and it predates Blackmore because it was in Dwayne Jenkins Brownstone campaign. And it was like, you know, the village priest idea or, you know, priest is not but like, you know, the pastor, like, you know, the person that would have been it because that's a Wild West game. Right. And I brought that up and I said, Mike, tell me about this. And he said, no, he played a cleric in Blackmore before there was, a, you know, it, that character type showed up in Brownstone. And he also said that in Brownstone, he was a retired gunfighter that was masquerading as like a, a priest, a religious figure. And so it's interesting that like he kind of was playing a religious figure in both, but in Brownstone, it was actually a masquerade. And I said, did that come before or after the cleric that you played in Blackmore? And he said, after. Now, Again, there could be confusion with memory because I know the Brownstone games didn't last that long, but his memory was that he played the cleric in Blackmore before he played the retired gunfighter that was masquerading as a priest in um, in Brownstone. And again, that, I just wrote that on my notes as I was chatting with him, and, and I do think that there could just be some confusion there. Um, okay, so that's the cleric. Okay, so now we get to the thief. And, uh, and interestingly, again, I have a whole video on where the mechanics for the thief came from. So first officially published in Greyhawk. However, again, it had appeared in the Great Lakes game, Great Plains game players newsletter, um, in an article by Gary Gygax before that, in which Gary says that he was got a call from the folks out at the, you know, the short version at Aero Hobbies in Santa Monica, and they had created a thief class that they were using. And so the guy explained this to him. It's, it's Gary Switzer is who he's talking about. Uh, Gary Switzer explains to him over the phone how the thief class mechanically worked in their games. And Gary takes notes and then ends up publishing it again in the 
Great Plains Games Players Newsletter. And then again, officially in Greyhawk, and it becomes, you know, incorporated into Dungeons and Dragons. However, I talked with Dave McGarry at DaveCon, and he was actually the first person to play a thief in Blackmore. And that predates, again, Gary's uh, creating the thief class and Gary creating the thief class in in the Greyhawk supplement. And also just in general, Gave, Dave McGarry was playing a thief in Dave Arneson's Blackmore games before Gary Gygax started his own Blackmore style game that he called Greyhawk. That's where Greyhawk comes from is Gary Gygax, after having played Blackmore with Dave Arneson and uh, folks, he started his own Blackmore style game, just like we have Bronstein style games that I talked about before. Now it's you're getting to where it's like a Blackmore style game and Gary starts one called Greyhawk. And that's where he starts figuring out a lot of the things that he wants to put into Dungeons and Dragons, as well as again, of course, taking information from Dave Arneson. But in any event, before that happens, Dave McGarry is playing a thief in Dave Arneson's game. And again, this was something that he was assigned. Dave Arneson said, you're gonna play a thief. And uh, the story that Dave McGarry told is really fun. So there was another player, and I just forgot his name, but there was another player who was playing the merchant. So again, I have a video on the, you know, Dave Arneson's forgotten classes, the merchant and the um, sage. And I talked about this a little bit, but there was a merchant character or role or archetype, whatever you want to call it, in this Blackmore game. And so Dave Arneson assigned Dave McGarry to play a thief because, again, part of the way that these games were played by back then was that the players weren't necessarily cooperating. They had their own individual goals that sometimes might conflict with someone else's goals. And so Dave McGarry's thief was given a list of goals that he was trying to accomplish. And so one of the things that he needed to do was like steal from this merchant character. And so Dave McGarry's setup, because nobody knew he was a thief. Okay. You don't just announce that you're a thief. So Dave McGarry's character that he was portraying in the game ends up, um, you know, his headquarters essentially is in a building next to this merchant, like I guess warehouse or office or however you want to describe it, um, where this merchant's located. And the way Dave McGarry described it was like that was done on purpose to give Dave McGarry access. He ends up tunneling underneath so he can get into this warehouse so that he can steal all this stuff because that's one of his, uh, you know, objectives to help him like achieve, you know, victory in a sense of, you know, lack of a better word. So, and then he takes like half of his forces to create a distraction out in front so that the warehouse like empties and then the rest, the other half of his guys go underneath through this tunnel that they've been working on and steal all the stuff. And then he was saying that like, the, again, I forget the name of the player, but whoever was playing the merchant, um, was like really upset that this because <laughs> he basically Dave McGarry got the better on him. So he's playing a thief. So what's interesting though is again, these archetypes or these roles that the characters are playing, while they share names in common with what eventually will be classes in Dungeons and Dragons, there's very little mechanically about them that is similar. And one of the reasons for that is that Dave Arneson is approaching the way of playing these types of, of games as role play. So it's, it's kind of a little difficult to kind of understand, but Bronstein is a role play situation as is Blackmore. And I'm, I'm, being very specific about how you use this term because the word game wasn't added until later. So first off, even with this, you see this is rules for fantastic medieval war games. I know I talk about this all the time, but it doesn't mention role playing because again, they hadn't talked about this then, but Bronstein is role play. Blackmore is role play. Eventually you're going to combine role play with games. Now, it's not like it's a, a one or the other. You can't have both. But Dave Arneson was very much more heavily weighted towards the role play. And again, he says Dungeons and Dragons came from that kind of role play school. If you want to call it that. Later on, you're going to add mechanics back in to try to help, again, explain to people how to run this game. And some of these mechanics are based on war games. OK, so that's where the game part of role playing game comes from. It's mixing role-playing elements with some game elements and a lot again of those game elements or mechanics 
um, come from war games. Okay. Not all of them, but some of them. Okay. So that's kind of where the two things come together. So it's not a this or that. It's not a this thing de de definitively happened. This was this way. And then it became this and then it became this. You can't do that. All these things were happening at the same time. Gary Gygax has been exposed to these styles of games because, again, remember, as early as 1969, he's played in this first campaign, the one I played in with Bill Hoyt, a recreation of that first game. Um, but Dave or Gary Gygax had played that with Dave Arneson in 1969. Dave Arneson and Dave McGarry end up doing a more like what we would call traditional Blackmore style game. That's, again, more heavily role play versus that first one that was a little bit more war game like. Um, in 72 and then he starts his greyhawk game with the intent of being able to publish these rules that will eventually become this right okay but during that time now gary and dave are talking back and forth all the time a lot of it's letter writing because phone calls were long distance back then be a little bit more expensive right but they are they are sharing ideas and they're working things out and so at that point it becomes really kind of difficult to sort of see like which elements are coming from where okay so then when you hear dave arneson say like oh we used chain mail twice and then discarded it to do something else that's kind of what i'm getting at is like it it does become difficult to kind of have these hard and you know hard and fast separation lines because a lot of it then is being developed kind of in conjunction it's just that we know a lot of the things that came from blackmore originally and these roles or archetypes like thieves and merchants and clerics paladins blackmore okay so there was a, a guy playing a paladin archetype in blackmore i want to say it was um oh, i just forgot his first name his last name is svenson s-v-e-n-s-o-n -S and so he played the great svenny was one of his characters who was a paladin okay so when you see paladins show up in the greyhawk supplement along with the thief part of that is because they had debuted already or were being played already um in dave arneson's blackmore game so a lot of the mechanics that end up being put into dungeons and dragons are put there for a reason of, of basically making it more of a game than just pure role play so the of course we hadn't invented at that time the term role-playing game but role play and game existed kind of separately and so what the mechanics are doing and what the the role <laughs> the role that they're playing sorry for the pun there but the the purpose of the mechanics is to create this as a game because it's very difficult if you've played in a blackmore game and you've seen dave arson run that you've participated or even if you've just watched it as a as you know a spectator you kind of get the idea of how that works but to try to translate that into explaining to people who have never seen the game before who've never played with gave or uh, with dave and his crew in minneapolis so trying to explain it is very difficult but if you start to implement things that have you know rules that have like specifics to them you can make that so that you know you follow these procedures and this is how you do this thing so that was one of the reasons for putting these mechanics in there now something else that i have been told and uh you know take this with a grain of salt because again as i mentioned before there are two very different there's like the lake geneva wisconsin camp and there's the minneapolis camp and more than 50 years later they're still kind of arguing about who really created this thing and uh, one of the things that I was told by a member of the Minneapolis group, I'm not going to say which one, but one of the things that was explained to me was that Gary didn't necessarily fully grasp what Dave Arneson was doing as far as how to explain it to other people, right? So Gary ends up, and again, these aren't my words, this, I'm paraphrasing what someone told me, Gary kind of ends up defaulting to like the thing that he knew better, which was like, you know, hardcore war game mechanics, because those are easier to explain. You know, you've got different troop types and they have different movement types. And then th this weapon does this kind of damage and you move this far and you end this kind of thing. Right. So some of the concepts that we get in Dungeons and Dragons that take it away from pure role play to become a role playing game, those mechanics are added. And Gary seems to be one of the primary people that put those in there. So as an example, something like alignment that shows up 
in advan- or, uh, in original Dungeons and Dragons. You have your alignment table here of um, character alignment, including various monsters and creatures. So this seems to be very much a, a Gary Gygax thing, this alignment idea. Um, I was told that Dave Arneson didn't really like alignment, didn't use alignment. It wasn't part of his campaign. Now, he's definitely got, as we saw in First Fantasy campaign, <clears throat> he's got his evil, neutral, and good forces here. So he he's thinking about that, but he's not using it for his characters, his roles, his archetypes that his players are playing. Okay, so that seems to be more of a Gary Gygax thing. And again, it goes back to this idea of like factions. I have a whole video about alignment, but the idea is, you know, which faction are you aligned with? Are you aligned with the forces of chaos or the forces of law? Okay, so alignment becoming a shorthand descriptor for personality that doesn't happen until much later in the evolution of D&D because originally again it was this 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 idea of factions and it was originally called uh, for what I remember correctly in some of the pre Dungeons and Dragons drafts that were done it was called division so it wasn't alignment it was like what 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 division are you I'm on the, I'm on the division of law or the division of chaos so and again you can see just by use of that term what alignment was originally intended to be. Okay, so that seems to be a Gary Guy I guess thing. Another thing that I think is really kind of fun is again, he's he has to figure out how to translate this idea of player roles or player archetypes into mechanics that can be explained in a rule book that can be sold to people who've never seen this seen this game played. So they end up with the three classic character types in original DD. The fighting man, or later called fighter, magic user, and cleric. Okay, and the reason that they only had these three, because we know that Dave Arneson had other roles in his Blackmore game prior to the publication of DD. I just talked about the thief, but we also know there was a merchant, there was a sage. There was, um, again, there was uh, the Paladin. Okay, so there was all these different things. Now, later on, a lot of those are going to come into D&D, but from the get-go, they just have these three. And I asked, how did they set on these three? And the way it was explaining it, it was because these are the least complex of the classes. So um, it's just, it's very easy to understand what you're doing. You have a person who fights, a person who casts magic spells, and a person who does a little bit of both. It's what a cleric is. It's a little bit of fighting with a little bit of magic use. And, you know, they they have healing and some other abilities. But those were the three that they went with for being the least complex of the the multitude of options that were available. Okay, so that was um, one of the reasons that that those were created this particular way. And then they're described mechanically so that people can actually play this game. Okay, now another really interesting thing that's in here that Gary adds to the description of the classes in this game is level titles. So I wouldn't call this a core concept of Dungeons and Dragons because you can play without it, but it's included in here. And I want to talk about it because it's relating to, again, this idea that Gary Gygax is borrowing concepts from war games as, and then he's trying to implement them into the game so that he can explain to people how to play. Okay, so Dave Arneson's very much pulling from the role play school, the role play example set in Bronstein, and that's how he runs Blackmore. Gary Gygax, not that Dave Arneson didn't have a background in war games because he did, but Gary Gygax really pretty much at this point only has a background in war games. The only role play that he's actually seen at this point would have been Dave Arneson running a game of Blackmore with him when he and Dave McGarry went to Lake Geneva to show Gary the game. So Gary is describing things in terms that he knows and that he knows other people that will be picking up this game will be able to understand. So where do we get these level tiles from? Why are they in here? Well, if you look at the level title for a fourth level um, fighting man, which is hero, and then an eighth level fighting man is superhero. Let's go back to Chainmail. And if you go to the fantasy supplement in here, you see the description here for heroes. It says they have the fighting ability of four figures. And then superheroes, they act as hero types in all cases, except they are about twice as powerful. So if this is worth four as a hero, then a superhero would be worth eight. Fourth level fighter. 
eighth level fighter. So that's where this level title comes from. It was a shorthand way to describe the fighting ability of the figure that you had on the table. So he does it with fighters, and then he has to create titles for magic users and clerics, because for Gary, these were representing figures in a war game. Okay, so you needed to be able to describe what was the fighting ability. And they weren't using, like, you wouldn't say fourth level fighter. You would say, oh, I have a hero. And then you knew automatically that, that meant it had the fighting ability of four figures. Okay, so that is kind of a, a small example of level titles and, and what their purpose is of this. I know a lot of people never use them. Um, I think they can be kind of fun. And again, if you watch that little short video, I'll put a link here, but um, I have an idea of what you can do with level titles and, and make it part of your game and kind of make it fun, okay? But that's something that Gary's doing um, to try and incorporate some, some more mechanical things to be able to better explain to people how to play this style of game. So really quickly, the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this video is where did the fantasy or the fantastical elements come from in Blackmore and in Dungeons and Dragons? Well, we know a little bit from Gary's standpoint, because again, he's published Appendix N in the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. I've talked about this before. I have a whole video about the Dungeon Master's Guide, but Appendix N is his list of his inspirational you know, reading, as he says, like what inspired him to, to, you know, create the certain creatures and species and, and monster, all that kind of stuff that he put in, it comes from his inspiration. However, of course we know, and, you know, we, we see his fantasy supplement in Blackmore, or I'm sorry, in Chainmail, uh, where he adds, you know, a lot of Tolkien based stuff, dwarves and elves. There's Ents in here, I believe. I know there's Ents in D and D. Uh, he's got orcs. Okay. So that's that. However, we know that there's fantasy in Blackmore, obviously prior to Dungeons and Dragons being published. So where are the Blackmore fantasy sources coming from? So here's where things get a little bit interesting and maybe kind of a little bit different than what you might be expecting. So I spoke with the folks again, when I was at DaveCon, a little bit about, you know, where were these fantasy elements coming from? And there is a source, and I forget where I saw it, but one of the things that like everyone in the Minneapolis gaming group was reading Tolkien. So I asked Dave and Gary that, and he actually said no. Like he said that he himself, Dave McGarry, was very much a Tolkien scholar. Like he reads it all the time. He reads and rereads it. And he was kind of like the guy that knew about Tolkien. Not that the others didn't read it or, or weren't aware of it, but like he was the guy, you have to remember this is the sixties. So the books have just kind of come over to the United States and it was very popular on college campuses and with certain groups of people, including war gamers. But apparently of the group, Dave McGarry was kind of like the guy that was into Tolkien. And I said, well, what about Dave Arneson? Was he in it? Now, Dave and Gary said, no, not as much. Now, I don't know again, if that's true or if that's a memory thing, or if it's, um, you know, it's a scale, right? He, he said, no, not as much. So not to mean that he's not into it, but maybe just not as into it as much as Dave McGarry is into it. So then where does that leave us as far as Dave Arneson's sources for like where he's getting his ideas? Well, I think you've got kind of three main things that I can think of. So one should jump out to you pretty quickly when you go through here and look at, it's on page 74, I believe. Yes. The description of magic items and magical items. Now I have talked about this before when I talked about uh, magic and D&D, but if you look at the magic items here, illusion projector, skimmer, borer, screener, tricorder, medical unit. Okay. So tricorder is a very specific term, which of course is coming from Star Trek. Okay. So Dave, Arneson was really into Star Trek. Now, of course, this is the 1960s or, you know, late 1960s, early 70s. This is going to be the original series of Star Trek. There were no other Star Treks at this point. The animated series hadn't even come out yet. So Dave Arneson was a big fan of Star Trek. Now, there is a report of one of the games that he ran where it was um, Romans versus, I guess, Celts or something like that. I forget the exact armies, but the gist of it is that one of the um, players had 
on his side, a druid, like high, a high priest druid, okay, a high level druid. And that druid had a wand that um, could make people like disappear. And that wand was a phaser. That's, just, that's exactly what it was. It was a phaser. And it is related from narration as being like this, this, um, again, like a wand of disappearance or something like that. And, uh, I, I know that there are in Blackmore, the evil high priest from the Temple of the Frog, he has a bunch of items with him that are all science fiction items. They're all like he's got power armor. And um, again, he's he's got all these different kinds of things, battle armor, and he's got um, a medical kit. OK, so Dave Arneson's very much influenced by Star Trek as far as the things that he's putting into Blackmore, because to him, there was no separation of like fantasy and science fiction is just all going in together because that's the kind of style of game that he wanted to run. One of the original Blackmore games that was ever played was the players were playing themselves and they crash landed in Blackmore. So they're modern day people crash landing in Blackmore. So that was one of the early Blackmore sessions was, was playing that way. So there was none of this like strict division of like, we have to have strict Tolkienian fantasy because that's not Dave's influence. Okay. So there's, that's, um, that is a Star Trek. Now also, Dave and other players in the group were really big fans of this TV show called Dark Shadows, very popular at the time, um, kind of like this, you know, modern horror type series. So that's where you get things like, and this is again, what I've been told, like, you know, third hand from these guys was uh, the original person that played a vampire in Blackmore, which was the inspiration for Dave Arneson to assign the cleric class to Mike Carr, the cleric archetype, not class archetype or role to Mike Carr was as a foil for this vampire character um, or player. So that player, I think it was David Fant, F-A-N-T, Fant Font, not sure how to pronounce that uh, if I remember correctly, but he was a big fan of Dark Shadows. And again, Dave Arneson is listening to his players and wanting to make sure that he's doing things that excite them. So he allows this player to play this vampire character because the player was really into the show, as was, as I understand, Dave Arneson. Okay, so you have Star Trek and Dark Shadows from TV. Now, the other thing that Dave says, this is kind of fun. There is an article, uh, an interview, an interview with Dave. And he mentions this a few times over the years, but I think the very earliest one was in a magazine called Wargaming. Issue number four, Wargaming was published by Fantasy Games Unlimited or FGU. If you read Dragon Magazine back in the day, you couldn't escape Fantasy Games Unlimited because they advertised in every single issue. Um, they they put out, uh, they were very prolific in putting out a lot of different role-playing games, you know, so Space Opera and Bushido and Villains and Vigilantes. And uh, those are just the three that came to the top of my head, but there are many, many more. Okay. So uh, they had a magazine very much in the style of like Dragon Magazine by TSR. And in issue number four, 1978, uh, there's an interview with Dave Arneson. And he mentions that one of the things that inspired him, he was home on a, uh, on a weekend and he was reading Conan stories, Conan the Barbarian. And uh, I think it was like he was eating popcorn, but he was also watching these movie marathons on, I believe, Channel 5. And I knew what the call orders were. I actually ended up driving by the least, I don't know if this is the original location of the station, but a location of the station while I was in Minneapolis. I want to say KTSP, and I'm, probably that's wrong, but I'll put the thing up here on the screen. But um, in any event, he was watching on a weekend, they would do these like movie marathons where they ran old horror movies from, you know, as early as like, I think the 30s, all the way up through the 60s. And, you know, a lot of them just, they're not good. They're kind of, we would call them schlocky by, by today's standards. But these were the movies that these guys, all these old black and white films. And so he says that he was watching some of these movies. Now, people have tried to go back and track down like what was airing at what date. And that would be the thing that inspired him to like create, some, like as an example, the Blackmore Castle. Okay, well... Again, it doesn't really work that way because there was a Blackmore Castle going back to the late 60s that was originally a fort in the game. 
Okay, there was a model. I showed it in my last video. Here's here it is. This is the original Castle Blackmore before it was Castle Blackmore. It was a fort. And eventually it becomes a castle in the game and people can go in underneath and explore it. And one of the stories that I heard was because it was, you know, it took place in one of these these battles, these more miniature war game style battles. And after the castle fell in those battles, like the forces defending the castle were defeated, people wanted to see what was in there. Now, Again, these are all stories that are being told of someone's memory of a game that happened. So take it with a little bit of grain of salt. But I think trying to pinpoint the exact moment that someone would have seen a movie and then that would have been the movie that inspired him to create Castle Blackmore. I, I don't know that that's something that we can actually do. But what we can say is he mentions watching these movies, Dave Arneson does. So it's very clear that, and, and these movie marathons aired for quite some time, like every weekend. So yes, he was definitely inspired by them. Um, but I, I think it's it more the collective work of those movie marathons, not a specific movie on a, a specific day. I could be wrong. That's how I interpret it. Okay. So I think that's really fun though, because again, we know that he's reading Conan the Barbarian and these horror movies are influencing his fantasy. And then the other thing that I was told, again, by one of the Minneapolis gang group was that they were very aware of H.P. Lovecraft in the kind of the Cthulhu mythos, which would stand a reason if Dave is reading, Dave Arneson's reading Conan. Robert E. Howard did communicate with H.P. Lovecraft a lot in their early days. They did some sharing of things where some of H.P. Lovecraft's creatures and other ideas ended up in some Conan novels because they were sharing. It was an open world kind of situation. So... That's the Blackmore kind of, those are sort of the, some of the fantasy elements that end up in Blackmore. It's, it's inspired by a completely different set of fictional sources. And that's my point, whether you want to nitpick about which you know movie it was or things like that, I think is the bigger point is the inspirations in Blackmore are very different than the inspirations that Gary Gygax had. There's overlap, of course, there's overlap, but a lot of differences. And I think that's very interesting. And it helps us to understand why Blackmore has much more of a science fantasy, almost bordering on science fiction feel. And that's going to be important for one of my later videos. It's going to be coming up talking about some of TSR's science fiction games. And I'm going to, we're going to retreat back to this idea or come back to this idea of Blackmore having some science fiction elements in it. Okay. So that is going to kind of be it for this video talking about, again, trying to date where these concepts come from in Blackmore, doing our best to sort of figure out the evolution of Blackmore as a game and understanding that it was not ever a single set in stone set of rules that were being played consistently time after time with the same group or even different groups of people. It was an evolving game that was changing over time as Dave was adapting, Dave Arneson was adapting, he's being flexible with his rules, okay? So we have that. Then we have this idea of looking at some of these concepts that are a core part of Dungeons and & Dragons. And for those trying to understand where did they come from and, and, and they're, again, the evolution of those concepts to what we have today and why they were put into the game. Hit points and armor class, saving throws, experience points and leveling, alignment, okay? So that some character classes or concepts or roles or archetypes or whatever you want to call them, how we got from the style that Dave ran to the more codified style that we end up with in Dungeons and Dragons. And then some of the fantasy and fictional elements that come into defining Blackmore and the setting the way that it was. So that's sort of what we just looked at, and that's going to wrap up this particular video. So again, I am going to be having a video coming out on early science fiction games, uh, from TSR. So I've talked about one of them before, which is Metamorphosis Alpha, but I want to go back even farther and we're going to look at those games. And I had an interview with Dave McGarry about them. And again, uh, I think it would be important for you guys to know. And it's just fun stuff to learn about that I wasn't aware of when I got into gaming in, the, in uh, 1981. But as far as this video, we're going to wrap up now. So I'd like to say Thank you again very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to drop a comment below. Let me know what you think, what you want to see coming up. Uh, if you learned anything in this video, if you have a different point of view, I know there's going to be some people that are going to disagree with me on my dating of things, and that's fine. Uh, I want to hear from you, and I'd love to hear from you. Just let's make sure we do it respectfully and have a conversation. Okay, don't call me out and say that I'm wrong or something like that. Or it's fine. I guess it's fine to say that I'm wrong. Just be nice about it. Okay, I'm not... 
again, I don't have an agenda here, so I'm not trying to push an agenda. I'm just trying to uncover or um, I guess I should share, share the information that I have learned. And if you have information that I don't have, please do share it below. And also while you're below, you'll find places where you can join me on social media. Um, you'll find links uh, to my blog where I uh, have created some content. And um, also I'd like to say uh, again, um, I do have a uh, super fans thing now. So if you would like to help uh, contribute to the channel and show your support, I would really appreciate it. And that's it. So thank you so very much for watching. Stay safe, happy gaming, and I will talk to you next time. Please help support More Daddy Rolled to One by buying a t-shirt, hoodie, mug, poster, notebook, or other items from my shop. Thank you. And now for the bonus content, what I was drinking, what I was listening to when I was working my notes for this particular video. So um, today is May 13th, 2024, and it is also World Cocktail Day, um, World Cocktail Day today. And uh, it's funny how I found out about this, you know, holiday. Uh, Years ago, um, my wife sent me a calendar appointment, <laughs> pre-kid, probably around 2005, I'm guessing, could have been 2006. She sent me a calendar appointment when I was at work, and it said World Cocktail Day. And basically, she's like, you know, make me a cocktail when when you get home from work and when she gets home from work. Um, well, interesting, I was working in corporate advertising at that time, but I ended up downloading all of my emails um, to a disk when I left that job. And I imported them into my email program that I use for my boutique agency, which is the same one, just Microsoft Outlook, nothing fancy. Um, but as a consequence, I have all these old emails and old calendar appointments that predate me setting up my boutique agency. So every year I have this calendar appointment pop up and it, it popped up today. So um, I just think it's funny. It's, it's a fun reminder because like my wife is no longer at the job she was at when she sent me the appointment. And I'm clearly no longer at the job I had when I first got that appointment. Um, that's a little funny thing. Anyway, so it's World Cocktail Day. However, I've been chatting with some folks in the comments, and I know that there are a few of you out there that um, do not imbibe alcohol. Either you never have, or um, maybe you're not of age, or maybe you have um, become sober. And uh, I just wanted you to let you all know, like, I see you. I, I, I understand that um, three of my very good friends down here where I live, including my very best friend, um, are all uh, sober now and they all came to it at a different time so my best friend is 90 days sober as of this past weekend and um and yet he and i still go to the pub every week with another friend of ours that is sober um to have lunch and um they just don't drink and uh, one of the things though that is fun when we get there is i'll text our, our bartender and say like hey we're on our way for lunch and she will put out a glass of soda water you know i'm going to use um, Pellegrino, because I don't have a soda gun, but she'll put out sparkling water for us. And then she will add um, Angostura bitters. So I'm going to do it the way that she does. Okay, so bitters and soda. This is a classic combination. And I'm going to put my hand here because this does tend to, the bigger bottle tends to squirt out a little bit more, but I like a lot of bitters in mine, so that's how I do it. And then a little straw. Okay. And then I also, again, like to put a little squeeze of lime in mine. So bitters and soda. So I drink this all the time. I drink it at least once a week at, at my local bar, but I drink it at home too. Now, I will point out bitters does have a little bit of alcohol. I and mean, that's kind of how it's made, right? You've got a high proof uh, uh, alcohol that you add your flavoring agents to. However, I know most people who are sober don't consider bitters to be alcoholic or not that it's not alcoholic, but like they don't consider it to be something that they can't have. So all three of my sober friends will drink bitters and soda. But that said, I'm not telling you to drink it if you feel like it's not something that, that you can do. Um, everybody kind of has their own journey of sobriety. And uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, I mean, I'm, you know, definitely don't feel put out or anything like that. Um, I'm just trying to offer alternatives for people. And I thought maybe this would be something for folks that, um, you know, do not drink alcohol and we're looking for something a little bit different. So 
Um, this is not even categorized like at the at the grocery store usually as as liquor because the the point is it is so bitter nobody can think of consuming enough of it in a quantity that could make you become tipsy or inebriated uh, because you wouldn't you just wouldn't do that you wouldn't drink it in that quantity that type of quantity okay so um, you saw I just put a couple little drops in there. Now I have this little box here because the thing is you can get all kinds of different flavors of bitters. So this is a gift that my friend gave me, but you can see there's aromatic and grapefruit. Nola, this is close to like a, a Peixot bitters from New Orleans, uh, but orange, black walnut, lavender, sarsaparilla bitters, lemongrass, cardamom, coffee, cherry, and then chocolate bitters. So you can play around with this and add all these different kind of fun flavors um, to your bitters and soda and uh, see which one you like best. So uh, that's Bitters and Soda. Cheers, everybody. Happy World Cocktail Day. And uh, to all of my friends out there, including ones who do not drink alcohol. Hmm. So what I was listening to. So another thing that's happened in the comments is someone was saying, could you feature a record that was actually put out in this century? <laughs> so sure. I hear you. And uh, here's the strokes. This is, uh, is this it? So I'm going to get into well, you can see it here. This is the Obi strip that came with my copy. Um, but this was uh, published at 2001, published, distributed, whatever you want to say, 2001. So uh, it is, you know, 23 years old at this point, but um, it is from the century. And so this is their debut album, The Strokes. And uh, I remember when I first heard them on here locally, I think it was on K Rock. And um, and I was like, what is this? Like, it's kind of, it was cool because it was kind of getting back to that kind of like guitar garage slash indie rock roots kind of thing that music kind of got away from for a while. And I just like the return, the simplicity. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but like, you know, sometimes music kind of, it was getting to a point where it's just getting a little bit too complicated for its own good. And um, this was a style of music that really kind of, to me, kind of harkened back to some roots of rock and roll. And I uh, really liked it. So I think probably the most famous songs on here would be Someday and Last Night. But the whole album's great. And uh, it was fun to listen to it. I mean, I've had this in my collection for a little while. And, um, you know, I don't revisit it too often, partially because, again, normally when I'm listening to music in my office, which is where my turntable is, I'm working. And I find it very distracting to listen to music with lyrics while I'm working, either trying to write or making, maybe doing a presentation or something like that. Um but I do want to kind of show that I do listen to more than just jazz and my collection is more diverse than that. So um, there you go. I hope that the person that asked me for a, a record from this century appreciates that. And uh, I appreciate you all for watching, staying through the bonus content. And uh, thanks again. Cheers. And I will talk to you next time.